Bible with you. We want to encourage you to bring one. But if you don't, I'm going to have the words up there on the screen. So we're going to read, read along with me as we look at the last church of the seven churches. And our desire is to see what Jesus is seeing in the church. That we would heed and we would obey and we would be found faithful and ready for his appearance. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, beginning of verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. As we've talked about, we start with our first point tonight, and that is the revelation that Jesus gives about himself here. He says that he is the faithful and true witness in the beginning of the creation of God. Let me say, first of all, this is an, this is an example of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where Paul says that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we are called to apply proper hermeneutics because a verse taken out of context can say something that it doesn't say. So for example, this is a perfect verse that someone that is of a Jehovah Witness background would say, see, he's the beginning of the creation of God. But that's not how it works. Scripture interprets Scripture. And so when you see the whole context, you understand what's being said here. It's the exact same thing that Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 when he says that Jesus is the firstborn of creation. That's not talking about Him being created. That's a sign of His preeminence and His authority over all that that is of creation. And so that's, the, that's what that means. It's a sign of preeminence and his rightful place of authority. But make no mistake about it, the Bible is very clear that Jesus is God come in the flesh. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus says in John 8, 58, Before Abraham was, I am. That's the name of Yahweh, the Eternal One. So there's no question about the eternality and the deity of Jesus Christ. But it is a sign of His preeminence over creation. But look what He says there. He says He's the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Why is this significant specifically to the church of Laodicea? Because the Laodiceans are self-deceived. They are living and walking in a lie. And Jesus says, I'm the faithful and the true witness. I know what's really going on. And you, Church of Laodicea, are deceived. The second thing I want you to see here is that there is a warning. He says, I wish you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I I just, when I was meditating on this, first of all, what strikes you, of course, is we talked about in the previous churches, Jesus always is looking for the good. That's who He is. I mean, He is the ultimate encourager. There's no one like Jesus. You want to be encouraged? Hang around Jesus. 
He is so good. He is so wonderful. And He sees the good that He has placed in, in, in every one of us. That's why it bothers me when I hear people say, this is a crazy tangent, but it's coming to my mind right now. When, when John and James, and they say, Lord, call down fire on that Samaritan, Samaritan village. And He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. For I've not come to destroy life, but to save it. And I hear people preach, God bless them, they say, the, son, the sons of Virginies, the sons of thunder, and they say that's because they had, they had quick tempers. And Jesus called them that. No, friend, that's not my Jesus. Jesus isn't going to label John and James something that's negative. No, he's saying they're the sons of thunder because they got passion, and he honors that passion. But he's not calling out like, oh, that's James and John's going off again, want to call on fire from the, from the heavens. That's not our Jesus. Jesus is so good. He believes. He speaks life into us. He always is encouraging us. But doesn't it strike you that he has nothing positive to say about this church? I don't want to move to a theological mentality on these verses. There's nothing theological that I want to bring out other than the emotions of this verse. I just want us to sit for a moment and to think, what could move our Lord and our Savior to say, I want to vomit you out of my mouth? I mean, we need to take that in, saints. We need to know. See, Jesus is not a stoic. And this is, a, this is an error of some areas of the body of Christ that need to be awakened. He's not up there like the deists say that he is, as like some big clockmaker that's wound up the time and he's sitting back and watching it unfold. He is a God of emotion. Yeah, he, is. he is a God who feels. Yeah. Jesus says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. And you see Jesus, he's full of, he's full of emotion. I mean, he's weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. He's turning over tables in the temple. He says in Luke 10 that he is, he's overjoyed when he, they come back with the reports that, Lord, even the demons are subject in your name. He's overjoyed. He says at the Last Supper, it's with exceeding desire. I have desired to have this meal with you. This is Jesus. He's not a Stoic. And I believe the connecting verse to his real emotions is Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12. He says, to, re, to the rebuke of Israel, he says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency. Sounds like the church of Laodicea. Who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. In other words, God is indifferent. And the consequences... It says in verse 13, Therefore their goods shall become booty, their houses a desolation. They shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. There's judgment with this false view of God. Because however we perceive God, however we see them, friend, that's how we're going to live our lives. And that's why we need to know the Word of God, that we rightly relate to Him, and therefore be what Paul has called us to be in Corinthians, and that are living epistles, known and read by all men, that when they see us, they see the character of Jesus Christ. So important that we rightly represent our King. Amen. He is. I mean, you hear, I don't want to get into it right now, but you hear there's this imbalance in the church. We need the full counsel of God. You hear people say, God's always in a good mood. He's not always in a good mood. How can you say he's in a good mood when he's saying, I want to vomit you out of, your out of my mouth? Do you think he's smiling when he's saying that? We need to return to the full counsel of God that we would rightly relate to our Lord and our King. His scripture needs to be preached in its fullness, not in part. Number three, this is the third point I will make, and this is, a, this is the one I felt the Holy Spirit impressed my heart to really focus on. Because you say I'm rich and I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
The thing about the kingdom of God, friend, is what is revealed in Scripture, is that the kingdom of God is the antithesis of everything of this world. And so when the world says, look at me, look what I can do, look at all my gifts, God says, you got your reward. You do it unto the Lord and unto the Father, and He'll see it and He'll honor it because you're doing it unto Him, not in the eyes of men. The world says, look at all of the things that I have and begins to boast. And God says, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. The word of God says, the kingdom of God says, if you want to go up, you've got to go down. If you want to be seen, you have to do it in secret. The word of God says that the kingdom of heaven is revealed in humility. It's revealed in not self-dependence but dependence upon the Lord. What I want us to see from this verse is this very clearly. If you look at the scriptures, there is a connection between pride and self-deception. Listen to the word of God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Deuteronomy 8.14. This is among many other verses that Jesus, uh, the Father, talks concerning Israel. When he says, then your heart will be lifted up. When he talks about when you come into the land that I'm going to give to you, do not, when you become full, become dependent. You forget where you've come from. And therefore, because of that fullness, he says right here, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. That danger of pride rising up and we become self-deceived. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 17 and 18. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Again, the connection to Laodicea. They were commending themselves. Finally, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Of course, you guys know the verse in Timothy this, is, this church of Laodicea, friend, this is something that I think every one of us in this room, you would have to have your head in the ground to not look over the landscape of the Church of America and not see the application of these verses. Every one of us in this room, by the world standard and by the history of the world, are rich. We must be careful that we understand that we want to live as God sees us and not as the world commends. As Paul says, some suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Godliness is never a means to an end other than for the glory of God. And if you hear preachers who are focusing on money and getting wealthy and about the seed offering and what you can get back out of it, and that's their talk, and not the glory of God and the purpose of finances, which is not to build your own earthly kingdom, but to see the nations reach for Jesus. If you're listening to that, or if you're a part of anything like that, the Bible is clear. Paul says, suppose them that they, they, godliness is a means of gain. He says, from such, withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we carry nothing out of it. And having food and clothing, and with these we will be content. Can I get another amen from that? The Lord has fed us. He has clothed us. And he has blessed us. Let us be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. 
For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The key here is those who desire to be rich. So why? God does entrust riches, but it's to those who understand why they're given it, and that's to steward it for the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. You guys know the verses that are clear throughout the scriptures about pride. Proverbs 16.5 is one that keeps coming back into my mind when I memorize that one. That the proud of heart is an abomination to God. And the proverb says, And assuredly, as hand goes into hand, they will not go unpunished. Proverbs 6, 6 verse 16 These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. And the number one and the first one listed is a proud look. We must understand if we are followers of Jesus, we are to manifest his character, and that is humility. I pray tonight that we would understand the significance of humility, friend. It's a safe place. When you allow pride and self-dependence to come in, you open yourself up for major deception. And we do not want a shock on the day of judgment. We want to understand, as Paul said, Lord, I want to be rich towards you. I want to sow into what you are doing. And God, your heart is for the nations. Number five. Oh, number four, I'm sorry. Number four, this is the remedy. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Jesus gives the remedy. He says, I want you to, uh, to, to buy from me gold refined in the fire. What does that, why did Jesus use that language? Friend, it's the Bible interprets itself. First Peter chapter one, verse six. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can it get any clearer than that? Friend, we need to come back as a church. I praise God for Kelvin who preaches us in the full council. We need to cross the landscape that God has ordained for trials to come into our lives. And we are seeing so many preachers preach as if you shouldn't live a trial life. You should live a pain-free life. You should live a life of ease and comfort. And that's not biblical. God uses trials to mature us. If you don't have trials in your life, how are you going to grow? We act like something's weird happening to us when we get tried. It's the will of God. And what's the purpose of trials? It is to reveal the authenticity of our faith. How do you know your faith is real or not if you're never tested? You're a baby. The little things that get upset, you stomp your foot and you cry and you pout. That's what little what one and a half, two year olds do. I know you know that you don't want to be like that, friend. The Bible says in, in, in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, We rejoice in tribulation. We rejoice. Why, Paul? Because it produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. Ain't no character without trials. And character produces hope. And hope will, the Bible says, will not disappoint. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God wants to mature us, friends. He wants us to grow. Because a life without trials leads to arrogance. And that's why you see so many people preaching and you're wondering, has this brother ever been through a fire? 
Which, 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 where, where, where is he at? Because when, you, when you've been broken, friend, it comes out of you. People can, can sense the aroma of Christ on your life because you have proven Christ. Yeah, Ain't no testimony without a test. We, we have overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. You are to declare God is faithful. Yes. He is good. When we have trials, it opens our eyes to what's important and what's not. Will we, what's going to happen under pressure? I don't know if you know this, but the word Gethsemane means olive press. And that's where Jesus was crying out in anguish and great, and great trial. And, and, and it says that the pressure was so strong, so heavy, that he was sweating blood with his tears. That's a medical condition where the capillaries burst under that kind of duress. He was praying and that weight was on him in Gethsemane, which means olive press. As the weight came down, what came out of Christ was nothing but a dependence on the Father and a confidence, you will deliver me. And what what happens is when trials come on our lives, the press comes and God wants to see what's going to ooze out of us. What's coming when the trials come? Is it going to be complaints? Is it going to be murmuring? Is it going to be fear or faith? Will it be anxiety or will it be adoration? The Lord uses trials, friends. He wants to mature us. Let us embrace Him as an opportunity to prove our God. Why did He choose gold to be a reflection of this? Because gold, gold is malleable. It, is, it can be fashioned and formed. And God wants to mold us. He wants to shape us. And as you keep smashing gold, as it keeps getting spread out, friend, it gets transparent, translucent, and that reflection can be seen. The glory of God, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3, can be revealed through us how much more under the new covenant than when it was under Moses in the old covenant. Let our faith be refined like gold, as Peter said, that it might result in praise and glory and honor at the appearance of Jesus Christ. Number five, what is the command? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. We know Hebrews chapter 12 says that God disciplines those that he loves. We need to embrace that and understand the significance that the discipline is because God loves us. I mean, the Bible says in Proverbs, if you don't discipline your kids, you hate them. You hate your kids. You're going to let them go on their own. The Bible says that foolishness is bad in the heart of a child. But when we love them, we discipline, and that's how our Lord is. When you're sitting in a place where it's nothing but being spoken, it's it's the itch, the ears, friend, to only to hear what people want you to hear, that's not love. That's not love at all. True love corrects. True love is willing to speak the truth even when it might hurt. But we have to understand in humility, we receive it because we want to show the Lord. We, We humble ourselves and we want to be correctable. We want to be rebukable. And we allow the Lord to speak to us. The Bible is clear. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's our Jesus. But an enemy multiplies kisses. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. The Bible is clear. It's an enemy that flatters. But the Lord and, 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 a, good, and a true friend will, will tell the truth, even if it hurts. If one is never feeling corrected, friend, if we don't ever feel corrected or open to correction, we open ourselves up to deception. Yeah. Jesus says here, and he said before, I wish you were cold or hot, but Jesus makes it clear what he wants here. Because he says... Specifically, therefore be zealous and repent. If you didn't know that, that Greek word zealous there, zelo, it, that's an that's a onomatopoeia in the Greek language. It's onomatopoetic. It's actually the sound of bubbling water. 
That, that's the significance. So when it says in Romans 12, be fervent in spirit, that's the, same, that's the same base Greek word. Be boiling up in the spirit. God says, Jesus says, I want you hot. I want you boiling over. I want you full of passion. And the enemy does everything in his power to try to take that passion away from us, friend. And the, the closer we draw next to the one who is a consuming fire, hallelujah, Deuteronomy 4.24, our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12.29, the more we draw near to that, friend, we become firebrands himself, ourselves. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, he makes his ministers a flame of fire. He's called us to be flames of fire. Can I get an amen? amen. I was, I just last week, I spoke at a Christian school in Rock Hill in front of, I don't know how many kids, 9th through 12th grade. And I was, I just saw a lot of kids that didn't have a vision. I could see it all over them. When I got up to tell them, I said, listen, I get it. Some of you are wondering, why is there more passion in the world than in the church? It ought not to be. We as a church should be the most passionate people in the world because we serve the true and living God. Yes. Nothing should compare to the zeal and the love in the hearts of God's people compared to anything of the followers of Satan. Let us demonstrate to the world there is no king like King Jesus. Let me go forward. The Bible says, uh, number six, we're, we're, we're coming to the last two now. I want you to see his great heart of love. What is Jesus wanting? Jesus wants fellowship. He's calling on them. They're independent. They're self-dependent. They're patting themselves on the back. And in the, the heart and the recesses of our Lord and our Savior, he says, I'm knocking. I want fellowship. Open the door. If you do, I'm coming in. I, I believe here, friend, I, you can interpret as you want, but I believe this is, this is a true uh, connection to the Lord's Supper here. This is, this is a, there's a connection here. Because this is, this is a means of grace. This is a means of recognizing where it all begins. It all comes to the cross. It all comes down to what He's done for us. And we have the Lord's Supper. We're coming back to our first love. We're remembering where it all began. I don't know where it began for you, but for me it was July 1987. I was lost, I was clueless, and Jesus stepped into my life and saved me. And that's your testimony as well. There was a time you encountered Jesus. And every time we come to this place, oh God, I remember where I was and what you did in my life. You didn't have to, Jesus, but you opened my eyes and now I'm yours. And there's a coming back to that place at his table that we recognize it's all, all about what he has done for us on the cross. Coming back to a recognition of our spiritual bankruptcy without Jesus. Finally, number seven, we end with this. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Isn't it amazing, friend? That the church that received the greatest rebuke and had the greatest problem is offered the most amazing promise? Yes. I mean, if that doesn't speak to the character of our Lord and our Savior, I don't know what does. I mean, it's like a parent, you know. There's been a few times I have been really not happy with my kids. And I have, I have shown them how displeased and angry I was at their behavior. But I'm telling you, it's because I love them. That's wrong. Turn. You need to recognize what you did was wrong. But when it's done, friend, I don't know about you, but my heart's full of even more, more love for my kids. I love them even more passionately. That's how it is, I believe, with Jesus. Even after his rebuke, he's filled with even more love. I love you. Come close to me. And I want to promise you even a place on my throne. What a Savior. What a Savior. So I want to close with this. Let us tonight be careful of the danger of affluence. 
Let us allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts if there's any area of self-dependence. Let us have our hand opened that what God would give, we'd be ready to give away. Let us be recognizing that everything that comes in our life that's good has come from the Father of lights. And let us always remain humble. You know, I was thinking as I was closing, I, I thought about Proverbs 18, 23. The poor uses entreaties, but the rich answers roughly. I love when I see people that have been trusted material wealth, and they, they're still humble people. And you would never even know that they have what they have. I honor my sister who married into a family that's like that in Colorado. If you saw this family that's been entrusted a lot of wealth, you'd never know it. He uses a push mower, he uses a push mower until now. I, I won't even say what he's probably worth. I can't even imagine, but the, you would never know because he's all about the kingdom. Amen. He's given it away. He's sowing to the nations, both of them, this, this husband and wife. And is it any wonder why God keeps pouring out upon them? Because they are just vessels of channel to flow through, to give it away for the gospel to be known. First Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives to us richly all things to enjoy. Praise God we can enjoy blessings in our lives. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may, be, may lay hold on eternal life. Let's pray together. Father, we ask in this country of affluence, we ask for forgiveness if we've allowed any way for the culture to impact the way we live. Lord, we don't want to be rebuked by you. We want to be walking in truth. Forgive us, Lord, for wanting just to be safe and happy. And in many ways, God, remaining immature. Let your fire have its work in us, O oh God. That it might result in praise and glory and honor at your appearance. We don't want any self-deception, God. Shine your light in our hearts and our minds, God, in our lives. We don't want any self-deception, God. We want to be humble before you. That, Lord God, you would see that we are walking in the truth. We would not be self-dependent, but we would be spirit-dependent. That we would be generous and store treasures in heaven and not on earth. Lord, tonight, thank you for this time together. Thank you for, Lord, the opportunity to be in your presence. But God, that's not, we know where it ends. You move us to this world that desperately needs to know you. So fill each one of us. Let us, as uh, our sister Sarah said, not show an insincerity, but a sincerity. Oh yes, we will face trials, but we take courage because Jesus has overcome the world. Amen.